And as you can tell from the giant logo behind me, I am speaking on behalf of Raza. And for those of you that don't know Raza, we are an open source conversational AI platform. And our mission is really to make the standard infrastructure for conversational AI. So of course, we do a lot of work with open source, but we also do a lot of work with enterprise. That's really our bread and butter, is kind of enterprise conversational AI at scale. So before I get going on the enterprise side, I do want to give a major shout out to open source community. I think today at this conference, it was really cool just to see what a big impact we've had. And working for an open source company is, um, let's, okay, work with me on this parallel. It's a little bit like what I imagine parenting to be. I'm not a parent, but the idea is, you build something, you spend a lot of time, you ship it out into the world, you hope it does its best, and if you did a good job at building, it comes back to you way cooler than how you left it. And that was my experience today. I think we heard from the uh, Estonian bureaucrat project. Checked out their GitHub, they're using Raza. Had no idea, but what a cool use case. Same thing this morning, we heard from uh, Professor Mc, uh, McTeer. I have that right, right? Yep, Professor McTeer um, told us about his ChatPal project. And that's a use case where they're also using Raza open source and they're uh, providing mental health support for people in rural areas. What a cool use case. Also didn't know that about that one until yesterday. So that's a little bit why I see why open source is a bit like good parenting if you get it right. So one more plug for open source. Um, the last one I'll make today because most of the talk will be about enterprise. Um, if you got a chance to listen to my colleague earlier yesterday, that's great. But if you haven't yet worked with Raza Open Source and you're interested, definitely check out the recording that happened yesterday. Um, Yusta is here on the slide here, and she would love if you would check out her workspace or uh, her workshop. All right. Oh, yep, I'm ready to go. So what I'm gonna do right now is over the last five years, I've collected a little bit of knowledge. I'm definitely by far not the most experienced person in this room, okay? But what I lack in longevity of experience, I've made up in variety. Because over the past five years before I joined Raza, actually, I was an AI consultant, which is pretty much someone who works on virtual agent implementation. And throughout this, this job, I got to wear many hats, one of which was, of course, conversational analysis, reading logs. I got to work with a test team quite a bit, setting up new test cases. I got to work on conversational copy. I got to be a conversation designer, work in Visio, move things around. So lots of different experiences. I've also gotten a chance to work with really big projects, little ones, voice ones, chat ones, projects that absolutely failed and projects that did really well. So what I wanna to bring to you today is kind of a culmination of learnings that I've had over the past five years working with enterprise conversational AI. And one of the first learnings, which I think ties in actually quite well with our last speaker's conversation, is that AI is hard, AI is hard. And the reason why I say this, I know most of you in the room already know this because you work in this industry, but not all of my enterprise clients do. And let me tell you, maybe I'll start with a quick story. I remember I was, I was still working at my other company and I showed up to my first day with a new client. On site, I had my deck ready to go. I was ready to transform their AI experience via PowerPoint. And one of my clients looked at me and said, um, she came over to me and she brought me all of her uh, chat logs. And I thought, great, we've got really good data here. This is gonna be really helpful when we get started. And so she, you know, we kind of kept talking and she kind of kept waiting for me to do the thing. You know, the thing where you take all the logs, you feed it to the machine, you press you know, come some kind of sparkly red learn button and then it pops out three hours ready, fully baked, Alan Turing tested, ready to go domain virtual agent expert. <laughs> And in reality, I think all of us in this room know that that's, we're not quite there yet with AI. It's gonna take a little bit of time. So my first learning today is AI is hard, but it's worth it. And here's why it's worth it. Because you can create really transformative conversational AI experiences with it. And we heard a lot of that from you, our speakers here in this room over the last couple of days. I think the other day we heard from, um, I think it was Kane Sims, sorry if I mispronounced your name, talking about all of the technology advancement that's happening and bringing us the future of conversational AI. For example, I remember he mentioned things like transformers and knowledge graphs. And if you're like me, when you first heard the word transformer, you probably thought of of, I don't know, maybe the movie with the giant robotic automobile machines. That's what I first thought of. But with a little bit of light Googling, light YouTubing, you get to understand that really this, this is a industry in motion and there's a lot of really good things to come in the future. And I think what's exciting too is we're starting to see vendors, I like to think ourselves included, take some of these new technologies and package them up into enterprise offerings. And this has the result of really democratizing AI and bringing, bringing this kind of technology to knowledge workers, domain experts, and bringing it to enterprise. So that's my first learning is that AI is hard. And I think that you know it's worth it, but you have to put in the work of training, 
building, maintaining to get the most out of it. So keep that in mind when you're working with your enterprise clients. Make sure you remind them that it's hard. <laughs> so my next point today is that feedback is fundamental. And I'll start this one off again with a little bit of a story. So a bit about myself. Um, I'm a product evangelist at Raza, and if you're wondering what on earth that, that, that name is, you know, what on earth for a Silicon Valley name is that, that job title, it's someone, I would describe it in two words. I'm a hype woman for conversational AI. And one of the things about this job role is I moved to Munich, and in Munich, I had to learn German. And learning German is really hard. And as, in case you couldn't tell from my accent, I'm American, and many Americans, including myself, are not naturally good at languages, okay? I look at some of you in the audience, much of my Europeans here who are waltzing around, exercising one of your three to four languages that you have. Meanwhile, I'm in the bakery trying to order a bread and end up with a donut. So you get the gist. And I, what I noticed through my, through my journey with conversational AI, over the past five years, I probably spent as much time reading conversational AI logs as I did watching Netflix in the pandemic. And that already said something about, the, about this journey. And throughout this whole log reading journey, I realized that my journey in language is very similar to actually that of chatbots to some extent, right? So imagine, I think a lot of you have had this experience, imagine you build your first chatbot, and um, it, you know, maybe it's a bit fresh, it's a bit new, it's not fully trained. And I had, I had this experience happen to me one time. Uh, the, I was reading through the log, and I realized that my bot had not answered the question that the person was proposing. And of course, the person said, in response, thanks for nothing. And the bot recognizes, ooh, intent, thank you, 90% confidence, boom. You're so welcome, have a wonderful day rough road. So I think, I think that's something that you see a lot with, with and, and, and this is something that me, as a language learner, I would do something very similar to that. I would miss the sarcasm cue. And the same thing goes um, for myself. When I look at myself, oftentimes I struggle with context in the same way that virtual agents do. I remember I was talking with some of my friends and I found out that, um, I, or I thought I found out that one of them had actually just lost their job. And so I had sent a whole message, I'm so sorry, let me know what I can do to help. And uh, the guy looks at me, or texts me back and goes, Lauren, I just got a job, <laughs> you know? So class, classic things like that where just missing context are parts of language learning that are challenging for bots too. So in a roundabout day, what I wanna say is just as I need feedback to get better at language, so do virtual agents. And my point here, what I see going wrong in enterprises is often there is a risk aversion to launching virtual agents that restricts enterprises from getting good feedback, right? They, they try and build it in an ivory tower, wait and wait until it's just perfect before they can release it on their customers. And I understand that customers are precious. You want to keep hold of them. But it's really important, at least here at Raza, we believe in something called CDD, which is conversation-driven development. Lots of you have maybe done a version of this to some form. But we believe that it's absolutely essential in order to improve virtual agents that you release them into the wild, you get feedback immediately, and you improve them. And so that's what I would, I would encourage for enterprises getting involved in conversational AI. You're going to have to lower your risk threshold so that you can engage in conversation-driven development. Get those bots in live, get feedback, and make them better. All right. So the next one, live off script. So <laughs> this is something that I've noticed with a lot of virtual agents, and this ties into the larger thing of enterprises being really risk adverse and being unwilling to allow virtual agents to exist off script. What does this mean? It means allowing users to go down journeys that are not the specific happy path that you've defined. And when you see this, it often looks like buttons or a really restricted dialogue flow. I have a thing against buttons, I'll just say fair warning. <laughs> I think I really think that we should strive to make conversational AI that works off script. So imagine it, let's just, you know, this will probably be the beginning and the end of my stand-up comedy career. Tell you a joke. Let's imagine a chatbot entered or exited the virtual world and entered the physical world. And a chatbot walks into a bar. You know, one, one of these buttonized chatbots walks up to the bartender and the bartender says, hello there, what would you like to drink? Chatbot responds, uh, recognizes intent, get order 90%, and says, I would like to order a wine or a whiskey. And then two buttons appear above its head. You only have two options. The bartender says, I'm sorry, well, we've only got, uh, we're only serving beer today. I don't know what kind of bar this is, but they're only serving beer. <laughs> and as, as the conversation continues, the chatbot, you know, slot not filled, the chatbot responds, I'm sorry, I didn't understand. I would like a wine or a whiskey. <laughs> and then you, you get how this goes. Pretty soon, the, 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 the bartender realizes that he's stuck in a loop and just gives, gives a chatbot a drink, right? Because, because ultimately, down, 
it's really, really difficult to engage in scenarios when you only have two options or four options. And transformational customer experiences are not built on scenarios where you have four options to choose. That's not what they want. And so that's why I encourage anyone who's engaging in conversational AI to really think about building systems that can live off of a script. OK, so the next thing that I noticed over the past five years that I think is really important to, to recognize in terms of, of what's happening in the future of conversational AI is something that I will call the multiverse of machines. OK, that sounds, sounds fancy. That's what I, it's a term that I made up. But ultimately, what I noticed in the last five years is that at a certain point, enterprise conversational AI, after you've gone through your training process, will reach sort of a critical mass where it becomes too complex. And what you start to see is kind of a, a moment when Almost, almost like a big bang moment where the larger project starts to decouple from itself. And then you have teams splitting off. You have language teams focusing on certain language. You have, uh, let's say, domain teams focusing on certain, certain domains. You have other, other teams focusing on, let's say, a one, one type of channel, a speech team, of, you know, a text team. And so this sort of decoupling of, of teams and, and this expansion into a wider orbit around one kind of central interface is something that I'm going to call the multiverse of machines, <laughs> which sounds fancy. But I think, I mean, in reality, customers have names for this as well. They just tend to call this something like the Virtual Agent Competency Center or Contact Center Plus, something, something like this. And, and I think that this is something that we're going to start to see a lot of in the future. And so what's the learning from this? As they say in German, so what learned? <laughs> um, I, think, I think what's important here is that us as vendors and enterprises are going to have to prepare for this reality that we won't work in these singular centralized teams in the future. So what does that mean for vendors? So we're a vendor, and we're being, being realistic, right? But we're starting to see some of our clients add us in to their larger stack of other com conversational AI vendors, right? So that means that we will be in the future sitting likely shoulder to shoulder with actually some of our competition under one, one client stack. So that means in the future we won't be able to own maybe the entire conversational AI journey of that one client. They're going to be looking for it in other spaces. And so that's, that's definitely something that we need to recognize. And I think that's something that we at Raza see as something that's really important for us. Another reason why it's great to work with open source is in the future you're going to be able to need to be a platform that's flexible to meet the needs of your customer because they're going to have very different looking teams depending on what types of things that they're investing in. And so long term, it's good to have a partner that's flexible. What does this mean for customers, enterprise customers? I think long term, once you start having, having this really kind of expansion into bot competency centers, um, one, one thing that you benefit from, benefit from naturally is not being dependent on any one vendor. And I understand why that's important for customers. But another benefit, I think, is that this movement towards bot competency centers allows for customers to really um, innovate, right? Because I think in the future, what we've, we've heard this from some of the other speakers here as well today, is um, the future, as we, we currently predict it, is where conversation is a modality through which many technologies flow. And I think that's, that's a really interesting point, is once you start splitting off into smaller groups, it becomes much more easy to innovate and to use conversation and maybe one bot alias kind of as your, as your, as your central focus point, and through it have many different customer experiences. So that is what I'm calling the multiverse of machines, um, multi-bot, multiverse, whatever you want to call it. It's something I think that's going to happen in the future and is already happening for some clients who've been at this for some, for some long time. All right, my last point for enterprises, because I think this is something that's, that I've seen go wrong in really good chatbot teams. So I've worked on a lot of teams. And at, at some point, um, what you start to see a pattern. And what you start to see is at the end of every POC, so proof of concept, you start to see that the people with the wallets in the company, you know, the people that are paying for the project, come in to your, your POC, and they assess whether it's valuable to continue paying for your project. And this is something I like to call judgment day, right? Because it's really, it, sometimes it happens literally on one day, I remember from working in POCs. You have someone come in and say either, yep, you're approved for the next funding round, keep going, a bit like venture capital, I guess, um, or that's it. You've now landed in, you know, I don't see the value, and then you land in what I call POC purgatory, right? Where you either have to go back to the drawing board or your great team gets entirely disabandoned. So how can you avoid this? 
I think one of the things that enterprises need to really make sure they think about up front is how they're going to provide value back to the business. And of course, all of us, the collective minds of all of us in this room right now can maybe think of 101 reasons why conversational AI is valuable. But it's important to put that in the words that someone who's paying for your project can understand. So the first thing I recommend to make sure that you give value back to your business when you're engaging enterprise AI is that you, can, um, you really think about your use case. Because really, at the end of the day, it's the survival of the fittest use case. Think about your use case, because if you take the time to do this, you will realize two things. You will understand the value of conversational AI. We've heard a lot of different reasons. Automation, um, maybe it can give a better user experience because it's available 24-7, it's faster to respond, lots of different reasons you can, you can bring tangible ROI to a user, but it's important that you map them out, understand them, and incorporate them into your business plan for this virtual agent. And the second thing I would say, in addition to understanding why you're engaging in virtual AI, or, ah, sorry, conversational AI, is to think about validating your use case. What I mean by validating your use case is making sure that conversational AI is the right choice for your problem. I've seen this happen a lot. I remember one time I was working on a procurement POC, and it was one of those POCs, which again, great team, lovely people, but you walk in the first day and you think, ooh, this is not going to, this is not going to pass through judgment day. And the reason was because they were trying to make a conversation around an existing form, a form filler that they already had. They wanted to make it conversational, which is a classic mistake, right? Because form fillers are much cheaper to manage and, and, and understand, we had that, that was my first lesson learned, is AI is hard, right? It takes time and training. And if you're just automating, you know, if you're making a conversational system after a form filler that already exists, it's probably not the best use of your money. So two things, understand why conversational AI adds, adds value, and then also make sure that you've validated it as the right solution for your use case. And the most important thing that I would say, you know, last point today for enterprises, when you're engaging in conversational AI, have a plan for demonstrating your value since day one. Make sure that you're collecting data, you understand how, you know, the quantitative one, how, how you're automating, how you're adding ROI, and report it regularly to the business. Because at the moment, conversational AI is kind of like, for a lot of businesses, a nice to have if they have extra money, right? It doesn't always become the most essential thing right away. They dabble in it, they make a bunch of POCs before they really commit to it. So until it becomes something essential, you're really gonna have to prove the value before someone just continues to support your goals. And I think since AI is hard and it takes some time to get it running, it's important that you demonstrate this value from day one so that you have something to show at the end of your POC. So, that in a nutshell, I think I'm pretty good on time. Um, is my five learnings from five years in conversational AI. Still a lot to learn going forward, but um, I would take some time and I'd love to hear if anyone has any questions. I never know if this is a good or a bad thing if no one has questions. <laughs> but I'll, t I'll, I'll roll with it for now. So thank you everyone. Um, enjoy the rest of the conference and uh, Hope you have a good rest of the day. Thanks for listening to me.